Welcome to This Is Horror. I'm your host, Michael David Wilson, and today we've got an episode with Joe Meinhart, the head honcho over at Crystal Lake Publishing. Now, today's conversation is a little bit different because rather than having this conversation alongside my usual co host, Bob Pastorella, it's just me and Joe. And it's a little bit more informal too, so that's why we just jump straight into things rather than, you know, introducing Joe in the usual way, which I want to do. So we're going to just get into it, we're going to jump in to the conversation, and you're going to hear us mid-flow. And this is going to be an interesting one because we don't always talk with publishers and as the founder of Crystal Lake Publishing, we get into a lot of the nuts and bolts of the publishing industry. Some of the struggles, some of the challenges and the whole Crystal Lake Publishing story. And on top of that, this is the first Joe Meinhart podcast. So this is an exclusive, a world exclusive, a podcast exclusive. And it's a long one, it has been split into two parts, so this is the first one, and the second one will be coming later this week, unless you're a patron, and then you could be listening to part two right now. Okay, well, before I present the conversation to you, let us have a quick word from our sponsors. Introducing If It Bleeds by Matthew M. Bartlett, a new charitable chapbook from Nightscape Press. One third of all proceeds go to the Dakin Humane Society. A toe-tapping track from way back spreads like a virus through Leeds, Massachusetts, heralding a new era of unspeakable evil. WXXT, the slithering tongue in the ear of the Pioneer Valley. Are you ready to rock? A satanic cult. A woman's brutal assault. Can Kirsty Thompson face her darkest fear before a demon from hell is unleashed? The Mark, by best-selling horror author Lee Mountford, is a haunting ghost story that will have you sleeping with the lights on. Available in Kindle, paperback, and hardback editions, as well as a high-quality audiobook produced by Hannibal Hills. Search for The Mark on Amazon and Audible now. Don't just read horror. Experience it. Okay, well, with that said, here it is. It is the debut podcast conversation with Crystal Lake Publishing's head honcho, Mr. Joe Meinhart. And now for a horror interview. Obviously, we like to start by talking about early life lessons. So that is something that I want to get into. And obviously, growing up in South Africa, I imagine that your answer is going to be quite different to other guests, and you're going to have some quite unique perspectives there. It really does change your your worldview. If if you're born in a completely different place than almost everyone I work with, and it's it's weird because. Um, it's almost like most people I work with, they they used to either living in England or America, where where I grew up seeing these places on TV. I mean, in movies. So this was like this is like a kid seeing Disney World and hoping they can visit it one day. Yeah, it's it's, it's very weird, but we'll get into that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, have you travelled outside of South Africa and have you been to America at all? No, um, the only trip I once took was in grade 12 um, with a friend. We just visited a couple of neighboring countries like um, Zambia, Botswana, Zimbabwe, those places. So I've never even flown anywhere, no long trips. Most of my life is spent right here at this desk. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, let's see, early life lessons. Um, well, for yeah, comics was big for me. Like that was comics and going to the library with my mom. 
there wasn't really, I mean, we had, okay, I was actually born in Namibia, um, which is like just a bit northwest of here. And there was only one channel on TV. That's it. Wow. <laughs> back, back then, it was still like, I think, 11 or midnight. The, the station just goes dead. Mm. And they, they play like the national anthem, that type of thing. I think they still actually do it back there. And that was it. So you had to entertain yourself. So reading was actually a lot more preferable back then. And I mean, this, this, you know, the options, I think the best time to watch TV was in the morning before school. They'd show like one cartoon every morning. And that was like the highlight of your day. So wow. <laughs> yeah. when, when the, I think it was the pharmacy started selling comic books. Like I was there every day. And library, oh, I used to be a big fan of, uh, well, I'm still, uh, Asterix and Obelix, you know, Tintin, those books. Yeah, yeah. And they had some sci-fi novels in the kids section as well, but that's it. They didn't have a lot of options back then. So I actually wish I read more of the like, big horror authors back then, but it just wasn't available. Yeah. And did you tend to find then that with the sci-fi section, were you looking for the kind of most horror sci-fi novels you could get your hands on was horror something you were always attracted to? The first big draw for me was the cover. Like, because I was into comic books a lot, but I, I'm not like those. My friends... So they just watched the pictures. Mm. I used to actually read the comics. So <laughs> so it was easy for me to go to the books. And then I always looked for the covers that made me like ask questions like, man, what's going on here? And, and most of them were more the darker stuff. Um, not really uh, comic, humorous, sci-fi. It was more the, and not the serious, like where you don't even understand every second or third word. Yeah, like yeah. <laughs> kids section, you don't have that so much, but definitely more the darker stuff. And for me, you know, if you tell a kid you can't do something, they like they like interested. Why not? So when I realized there's horror movies on TV, and I wasn't allowed to watch them, uh, I quickly started sneaking out at night when everyone thought I was asleep to go and watch Nightmare in Elm Street and all those slasher films. And from there, just grew and I loved movies back then. Well, still do, but, uh, and I kept asking these questions like, like who makes this stuff? Like <laughs> who dreams of this character with the long fingers and blades and all that. And for the first time I actually noticed at the end of the movies where they give the names. And I was shocked to see how many people it took to make a movie. Yeah. Yeah. And basically that's where my question for, of authorship came from. And I thought, man, that's going to be cool. I'll, I'll write books when I'm big. And so I actually had that idea like as a youngster, but never really did anything until I think 2005 or six, uh, no, 2008. Mm. I'll figure it out later on, but that's basically where I started looking like, man, why didn't I do this before? Let's just give it a try and see what I can find on the internet and go from there. Yeah. And when you were younger, were you like drawing stories? I know you said you weren't writing until 2008, but I wonder how much you were experimenting with other art I, forms. I used to um, trace the comic books and then see if I could merge two stories into one, like two comic book heroes versus each other, which they, they actually did later on. But for me, it was very funny to see uh, like the Archie comics, I used to merge the Archie comics with uh, what Silver Surfer and like this guy would go and visit <laughs> them in what was it Riverdale? Yes. Mm. So I had these weird ideas back then already. I actually had uh, a drive to create something out of basically nothing, and it used to bother me because I didn't know what to do with it. So I, I would collect stuff. I would. Everything from beer bottle caps to, well, comic books and what else? My dad had a um, postage stamp collection and later on I started collecting coins until I started creating books with people. Then I realized, man, this is like what I've been longing for my whole life to, to work on projects like this with people. 
and not just on my own, uh, with the authors, the artists, the reviewers, everyone who has an input in the book. Mm. Yeah, it sounds like with your merging of comics, you're a bit ahead of the curve because it wasn't <laughs> until, you know, 10 or 15 or so years later that particularly in the movie industry, things really took off with the likes of Freddy versus Jason. And I was actually surprised when I saw uh, the Archie comics went into a, what was it, zombie world or something they created. I haven't read it yet, but I used to be big into those comics as a little kid. That's basically my entire, and uh, my knowledge of social life came from Archie comics. <laughs> right, right. Relationships and all that stuff. Because otherwise it would have been just the horror movies and Superman comics. And yeah, I was actually more into DC comics back then, but now I'm more of a Marvel guy. But mm. you know. Yeah. And you were saying before that in terms of the English language that it's all self-taught. So do you reckon, like, did you predominantly learn to speak English via Archie Comics? Is that a fair assessment? I think so, because I only used to read the comics and then I think I was still in grade one. Yes, then my sister was in grade three and she was... I, st I still remember it. She, they were sitting on the bed, she with my mom, and they were reading uh, the prescribed English book for grade three. And they were taking a break, and I jumped on the bed, and I just started reading this book. My mom comes in, she freaks out because I'm reading English. Yeah. And I said, well, it's from the comics. And the bit of pronunciation came from basically watching movies. Uh, which we didn't have a lot back then. I think it was like Friday night was the only full length feature you would see. I think it was two movies in a row or something. And that was it. The rest was just sport and news and I don't know what else. So the comics definitely played a big role. And eventually the comics back then, I'm, uh, it's better now, but they used to have a lot of grammar and spelling mistakes in them. I don't know how that slipped through, but eventually, especially Archie Comics, eventually I started spotting the mistakes, and I think that's also played a big role in how I learned English. Yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, in terms of grammar and spelling mistakes, it sounds very similar to life when I was living in Japan. I mean, there are a lot of <laughs> signs and things in English, but... It's almost like a Japanese version of English. It's like, oh, you haven't quite got that right there. And I think often with translations from, in, from Japanese to English, they'll try and translate it very literally, whereas a literal interpretation mm -hmm. isn't actually going to make any sense. <laughs> I actually still laugh a lot about this because... Um, in South Africa, there's almost now a lot of Afrikaans um, shows on TV. I don't really watch them, but my wife loves them. And then there's English subtitles. and I just can't keep my eyes off words. So when, if a movie has subtitles, I read the subtitles. Yeah. I just can't look away from it. And then I would laugh at how they directly translate from Afrikaans to English and just make up these new sayings and stuff. Yeah. And yeah. it's like a serious moment in the show and I start laughing. <laughs> yeah, and you, you must have noticed as well. I mean, sometimes there will be a subtitle translation and because you know the original language, you're like, you haven't actually translated that properly mm. at all. You've come up with something different. That's not <laughs> what they said. I'm not a big fan of the Afrikaans stuff, it's maybe just because I've, English was my favorite language, basically, starting out as a kid. Mm. And we only started getting Afrikaans uh, shows in the last, I don't know, the first channel opened probably like 10 years ago. Uh, but eventually, as we moved from Namibia to South Africa, and then I think they were like two or three stations and then came all the satellite tv and all that stuff we basically only got like the options where people have lots of channels when i left school i'm like now my parents get satellite dish now they wait for me to leave the house before they get all these yeah. channels yeah <laughs> and so going to the movies was still big um, we still had the 
what they call the bioscope two movie features that stuff and uh but it, it looked a lot different than the ones you'd see in america and england it, it's almost like it was 20 30 years behind the technology that everyone else said yeah and do you find now that is there a delay in terms of if you see a movie has been released in the US or UK, do you have to wait a number of months for South Africa? Because, I mean, I, I found in Japan, if I went and looked at the release date specifically for the cinematic release, people would be getting it in the UK, and so I'd be seeing it all over my Facebook, and then I'd see, okay, when is this coming to Japan? And it wouldn't be coming to Japan until six or seven months later. <laughs> and at which point, I could just buy it off iTunes because I've still got an iTunes UK account. It used to be a lot longer, yeah. Um, with TV shows, it's actually really fast now. It's like for uh, The Walking Dead, for instance, It'll be on, I think, is it Sunday nights over there? Right. In America, and then the Monday night it'll show here, which really shocked me. But that was only until, I think, the last year or two. But before that, everything was at least three to six months delay. Yeah. I think it's with the because of the back then they used to still ship the videotapes over. And these days everything is digital, so they've got no excuse to make it faster. The movies in the cinemas... I'm not so sure because I don't really keep up to date with that mm. stuff anymore. But it's not the same day, that's for sure. Yeah. It's not the same release day as in America. Because I always read on Facebook first, everyone like talking about this, oh, you have to go see this movie, and, and then it's not even on here yet. So I'd say at least two, two, two weeks to a month delay with the cinemas. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it sounds like a similar case to how it is in Japan, because as you say, the on-demand video, I mean, that's pretty instantaneous. Mm. But I think the problem with the cinema is because for any English language film, they want to have Japanese subtitles. So that's going to take a very no, long time for them to <laughs> go through that and for them to almost get it right, as we discussed earlier. They have the options here with our TV digital uh, satellite stuff that you can also rent the movies online. So you can basically watch some of the movies that showing in the cinema at home. I prefer doing stuff at home, but I don't want the cinemas to struggle because that, that sounds a bit, I mean, yeah. normally if the cinemas first showing, then they can make some money and then the stuff goes to like home viewing. So this is a bit unfair in my point of view. Yeah, I think... I mean, I really enjoy going to the cinema, but as is the case with so many things, the problem can often be other people. There can be people who, you know, want to talk through the movie yeah. or they want to be <laughs> on their mobile phone. And I tend to find that the later you go or the more obscure the film is, like if it's an art house film then the only people often who are going there are the people who really want to see the movie and are dedicated to it. So mm. that will lend itself to a nice experience. Or, of course, if you go to one of the horror film festivals like Fright Fest we have here in London. Oh, that's nice. No, we, I wish we had stuff like that. Yeah, if, if anything in this country happens, it's always in the big cities, Johannesburg, Cape Town, and yeah, that's, I'm not going to drive that far for a weekend. <laughs> right. I right. I mean, how long would that take you? How far away is that to give a, people an idea? Cape Town is about eight or nine hours from here, I think. Uh, Johannesburg is not so far. That's about four, but uh, it's very expensive. So unless you have family there, it's like... Uh, guy from a small town having to go to New York and pay for accommodation and everything for a weekend, you're going to be bankrupt. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'd imagine so. And our petrol, well, gas, whatever they call it, is extremely expensive. I think you guys also have one of the highest petrol prices in the world. Yeah, it's yeah. the same here. Like, yes, you, you need to plan everything very carefully. <laughs> yeah.
I mean, of course, the problem in the UK is not only is the petrol astronomical, but the public transport is pretty expensive mm. too. But sure. Yeah. I think it still works out that travelling via public transport is the cheaper option now. Mm. I've gone a few times to Joburg for author-related stuff. and But, for instance, now we had our first... Uh, Comic Con, and I actually wish I went, but yeah, maybe next time we'll see. <laughs> Most of my money just goes back into books. Yeah, it's, I tend to not spend anything on myself, and now with the kid coming, I'm not going to take on any expenses now. Yeah, so I'd rather just save up and see what what she needs. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, and I know that relatively recently much like I did, you took the transition from part-time uh, running Crystal Lake and also teaching to just doing Crystal Lake full-time. So how long have you been running Crystal Lake full-time? And I know as well the, the similarity being having a kid on the way so that you could be a stay-at-home dad and run Crystal Lake. Mm. Let's see. Um, I started in August 2012. I started Crystal Lake. And beginning of 2013, the first anthology came out and it just kept growing from there. Uh, but the goal was early on to make this sustainable because I really wasn't having a lot of fun in my day job. Um, see, when I was young, this is one of those early life lessons stuff again. I realized that I was actually good at teaching people stuff. Mm. And I mean, I like I liked kids. I was always like playing with the younger kids instead of sitting with the adults and talking about politics and nonsense. So I thought, well, that, that then it sounds easy, become a teacher. But I didn't like the, first of all, the subjects I had to teach. Uh, so I'm passionate about teaching, but not subjects. And then... It just got worse from there. I mean, when I started teaching, there were like 33 kids in a class. When I finished teaching, there were 44 kids in a class. Yeah. Same classroom. Uh, the politics just became worse. The support you got from the education department from their side became less and less. Uh, you basically became like they were looking for something for you to do wrong. Like. If a kid, you can't even like high five a kid anymore. You, the kids run up to you, they want to argue, you have to push them back because any physical touch became a major problem. Um, teachers have been taken to court, they've gone to jail for, and then they didn't actually even do anything because they just believe whatever the kids say. And the, I mean, we've had parents beat up teachers, we've had uh, kids stabbing teachers. There's been murders. <laughs> yeah. So now it's, I, it just became worse and worse. And so I knew I had to eventually step back. And the last two years, I think I taught for like 12 or 13 years, but the last two years I was there, that was bad. Like, because then I already basically gave up on teaching. I just wanted out, which was probably unfair to the kids, but I'd talked to some of them since then and they didn't have a problem, they didn't see a problem with me or that I like neglected them or anything. And I stopped teaching, I think it was 2016, end of 2016. Yes. So thank goodness for that. But, um, so And now I'm still teaching people, but I teach them the stuff that I enjoy, the writing, the marketing, the publishing, the, whatever they need help with. If I know something about it, I'll help someone with it. Yeah, and what kind of age range were you teaching? Um, grade four to six, mostly grade fives. So that's 11 years, 10 to 11 years old. And soccer and cricket and what else did I teach? Uh, yeah, but that's the basis of it. <laughs> mm, yeah, and you said that you were concerned about not wanting to neglect the kids but obviously I mean I've said numerous times before on the podcast that we do have to put our health and particularly 
our mental health first. And the problem is that if my health declines or if your health declines to a certain point, well, you're going to be no good to anybody. So you do have to make what I guess could be misconstrued as a selfish decision on the surface to, you know, do a greater good overall for the community and for you. Exactly. You know, um, I was in a bad place there towards the end. But because you also feel guilty, like you're not giving it 100% anymore. But once you've reached that point, I mean, it's you just can't give any more of yourself. And that's actually one of the things that I don't like about teaching this. They think it's a popular saying to say, oh, you, you're the candle and you burn yourself out. I don't think any job should be like that. When no. You burn yourself out to the benefit of others. It's, it just doesn't work <laughs> for me. Right, yeah. And I mean, like I was saying, if you burn yourself out, well, okay, now now it's gone. Now the candle has disappeared. So what's the point? So, you exactly. know, burn to a certain point, but still have some energy left to burn later if we're going to continue <laughs> that analogy. Uh, and now it's easy to say that maybe... I was so spent and tired there towards the end because I was I had two full time jobs, but when I came home from school, like let's say uh, three o'clock, sport finishes, then I have to completely shift around my who I am. Like you, you go from this primary school teacher who basically towards the end got a lot of crap from the kids. And now all of a sudden you're this publisher guy who has to email like people that I look up to, people that I watched their movies or read their books as a child and basically just put on a different hat. And that transition was a big thing for me. It was difficult because it, feel, it felt like two different worlds. But the second part of the day was never that tiring for me. Although, I mean, I went to bed late and even now that I do it full time, it's a it's a full day's work every day. So I don't even know how I managed to do it with the teaching back then. I don't know. Yeah. Probably just have Facebooks a year. <laughs> oh yeah, I relate to that definitely, and it's something that I've been doing for a similar number of years too. I think there's a lot of parallels in terms of the path that we've both taken, but. Mm. I mean, I remember towards the end of your teaching, because we spoke a little bit about this via email, that you were suffering with some health problems. And so I was trying to give some advice in terms of dietary changes and things that you could do. So, I mean, let's talk a little bit about that and about the changes that you made and how you are today. Well, basically, I think it... Well, back then it all started with this, the stress and the two jobs. And first of all, you with the teaching, you're supposed to stand the whole day, but it's a lot of sitting, it's a lot of marking and stuff. And then I just come back here and I sit down from 3 till 11, 12 at night. And because I was not in a rush, but I knew I had to get out of there as quickly as possible. So the more time I put into this business, the maybe I can leave school a year earlier and the faster I can get out the better. So I neglected uh, exercise and just basically healthy living. I, my wife had to remind me to eat because they, I just didn't uh, take breaks or anything. It's just coffee and work. Mm. And I mean, I've seen people basically get heart attacks from just working, working, working the whole time. And I did have some sports injuries as a kid when I, I used to do karate quite a lot. And so some of those old injuries started coming back and I thought, oh, they'll go away in a month or two. They usually do. Sometimes they come in the winter and they go away and they just didn't go away and they just got worse and worse. And eventually, uh, even now, still sitting down for prolonged times, it, my hips, my back, everything starts hurting. So the only thing that saves me now is I do have a bit of more time now I'm going to have more even next year <laughs> because I have to get the kid out of the house sometimes. Yeah, and yeah. So I do exercise more. I eat quite healthy now. I've lost some weight, so that takes some 
pressure off like the knees and the hips and all that stuff. Uh, so it's definitely better. It's not fixed yet. So um, next year I think I'll concentrate on my health a lot more because this year it was also getting enough books out before the kid comes, setting up the company so that I can give some of the work on to other people, mm. people that I trust to run certain divisions and everything because I have no idea how the kid's going to be the first two or three months. We'll have to see how that goes. But luckily, there are people now in place to run the company yeah. at least until I get the hang of everything and get myself back in shape and so on. Yeah. I mean, I find that every day I have to go out for a walk. I tend to start the day with that. I mean, particularly when my wife is going to work so she'll take the train mm. to work and so what I'll do is me and my daughter I'll put her in like the baby carrier which I wear it's a, effectively a sling and then we'll walk with my wife to the train station and then after that I'll walk back and that'll mean that I've been you know w walking around for about 25-30 minutes in the morning and if there are days when I don't do that, I mean, I will feel that both mentally mm. and physically. So I do think that is an important part to play. And I'll also try and make sure that every day, maybe about mid-morning, I'm doing some stretches or I'm doing some exercise. And it's just an important way to take care of your physical and your and mental health. Mental, yeah. For me, it takes about 40 minutes in the morning to just get get rolling, get moving again and doing all the stages and everything. So even if I get up early, it's going to be about an hour before I can start working anyway. So now I just do my stages and sometimes I'll go for a walk, um, which I should be doing more. Uh, but some of most of the what it's called injuries and problems I have, they do feel better after a walk, but sometimes there's some of them where walking will just aggravate them. So some of them it's better if you sit still, some of them it's better if you keep moving. So every day is different. But um, since I cut most of the sugar, um, I, I can't cut all of it. I tried, but yeah. since I cut most of it, it's a lot better. They do say it promotes uh, inflammation if you take too much sugar and stuff like that. So that definitely helps. And at least I'm off all that pain meds that they prescribed, which was going to bankrupt me anyway. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think gluten and sugar are about the two best things that you can cut out in terms of keeping inflammation at bay. And that's certainly what I've been doing. And I mean, really, a lot of it is listening to your body, trying out different things and you're right that some days you will find that a certain exercise or even walking isn't going to work so much for you. So if your body is saying, look, can we just stay at home and sit down, then you've got to listen to it, even though sometimes I'm stubborn and don't want to. But as long as I put health first, then mm -hmm. things seem to take care of the rest. And that's what I didn't do there towards the end while I was still teaching. Like you just told your body, listen, I have to work, keep quiet. You push through the pain, which is like the worst thing you can do because it it doesn't go away when you finish working. You're just basically making it worse in the long run. So you think you're getting more work done, but by messing up your body in the long run, you're going to struggle so much that you're not going to be as productive as you would have been if you were like 100% every time, less hours a day. Yeah. Yeah, and I think, I think we, we learn lessons the hard way sometimes. Yeah, 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 unfortunately yeah. so, yeah. Well, I know when you initially started Crystal Lake Publishing that we actually ran a interview with you back in 2012 and we ran it with you to meet the writer interview just before mm. you'd set up Crystal Lake. I remember that, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> and... I know that in that time, one of the things that you were doing, as well as English books, you were putting out books of fiction and short stories in Afrikaans. Is that something that you still 
want to do with Crystal Lake or is that something that you've moved away from? I mean, obviously not reading or speaking Afrikaans. I might be a little bit <laughs> ignorant on what you're doing on that front. Um, we put out about three Afrikaans books, um, but ebook only because I was aiming at the the market of the South Africans that have already left the country. I mean, a lot of them have gone to Australia and Canada and they are actually looking for books that remind them of South Africa because we've got a very weird sense of humor here that you don't really find in most countries and it's and ghost stories. Uh, South African humor and ghost stories are very popular. So we put out two or three of those books and but they didn't really do I mean, it's difficult because where do you advertise unless you can afford to target specific magazines in Australia and Canada? Um, so it didn't work out quite well. I'm still going to put out maybe two or three because I have this this local author who is an excellent ghost story writer. Um, but if you translate it into English, it won't work. Most people will not get that humor. <laughs> so it's classic plain Afrikaans stories uh, which i still enjoy but mostly because of the way this guy tells it he's an excellent storyteller uh, so if you hear him actually speak we, we even thought about maybe recording him but it's just a lot of stuff i still have to get time for <laughs> yeah yeah Dude. yeah and i mean i'll often say that you can do anything you want but you can't do everything you want so mm. you do have to prioritize that time and say okay what is the most important thing for me to do at this moment or at this period in my life and i mean that's the key it might change from time to time but you know you can only do one thing at a time or you can certainly only do one thing optimally at a time and the another thing with the south african market is um it's it's been easier for me to get books into major bookstores in America. I mean, I'm talking about New York and London bookstores than getting books into local bookstores here. Right. They just, it's extremely difficult. Most people have already said it's like uh, you have to be part of the, almost like a boys club type thing. Uh, they only take care of their own people and they don't even care about, I mean, America, you hear about sections in a bookstore of local authors and they'll do signings and stuff they don't care here about <laughs> unless you are with a big publisher um, penguin south africa or whatever they do not care about local companies small companies or small press or new author self-publishing nothing they there's no support locally right. yeah i mean we don't even have um for instance, now the print on demand stuff, uh, if if I want any of our Crystal Lake books, I have to order them from America. Um, if I want to get them printed here, yeah, it's going to be minimum print run of 100 books, that type of stuff. Yeah. Mm -hmm. now, and even then, it, uh, it works out cheaper for me to order from abroad. It just takes a lot longer and sometimes the stuff gets lost, unfortunately. <laughs> our, our postage system is not very good. Every now and then they'll burn down the entire depot and steal and do whatever they want. <laughs> yeah. And if that... Whenever they, yeah. yeah, but just before Christmas, like this time of year, they tend to uh, go on strike for salaries. And I don't know if it's a cultural thing or whatever, but burning down the place where you work seems to be the way to get what you want. <laughs> right. Like, <laughs> right. See, if they'll burn... I've we've seen people burn down schools because they they don't like the they don't get enough education support or whatever so you burn down the one school you do have because you want more i don't know it's, it's just weird <laughs> yeah wow i don't even know how to respond to that <laughs> or to respond to that we also don't know mindset. how to respond to that it's, yeah it's a little bit like a Ray Bradbury book, isn't it? <laughs> right. Yeah, like the burning down of things. <laughs> ah, but um, if, if I look at now talking about all this stuff that's happened and that 
I'm doing now and that I'm going to do because I'm, I'm like an idea. I'm actually the idea guy of this company. That's what I want to be. And I'll put other people in charge and they can do the stuff. I just want to come up with awesome new ideas and everything. But if I look back at everything now, it's, it, it's almost like everything happened for a reason. So even the weird stuff that happens, I mean, whether you learn from it or it's just, just plain experience. I mean, for instance, in high school, um, where I had to choose the subjects. Um, I can't remember which what my choices were, but for some reason I chose typing. I mean, mm. Plain and simple, you sat in a classroom with, maybe it's because it was mostly girls in the class, uh, you sat by a typewriter it, and you just typed, that's it. Like, And what use was it? But now when I look back and what I do now is it's the one subject I still actually use the most <laughs> yeah. from school. Imagine I had to still type with one finger or two fingers. And I mean, I send thousands of, or not thousands, I send a lot of emails every day. Um, and the faster I can go through them, the better. I write ad copy and book descriptions and whatever else. And if I had to type two fingers, um, I think it would have taken me two or three more years just to fit to, to quit my day job. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Get why. So everything happens for a reason, even the, the crappy stuff. I mean, for instance, I went to university for good grief nine years, uh, combined with teaching and uh, human movement sciences and stuff that I did there. And now it's easy to say I'm not using any of that stuff anymore. It was a waste of time. But I mean, you learn, for instance, that I was a lot smarter than I thought I was. It's, the teaching was easy, but that um, biokinetics, that stuff is quite difficult. But I really enjoyed it. It's just uh, you don't get a lot of job opportunities for that in, in this country. So. Right. Yeah. We're not that, that big on sports. I mean, even our sports stars, they still have full-time jobs. <laughs> wow. Yeah, it's, it's, it's weird. I mean, you hear all these nice things about first world countries where... Um, people get paid these massive salaries for sport and um, I think in Australia they pay or they give parents money to take these kids to these sport clubs and everything maybe it's just rumors I don't know but even the schools I mean we need uh, money from like the national lottery to help supply um, cricket nets and soccer balls and whatever else this, most of the parents don't even pay school fees they just say sorry they can't afford it right and you can't put the you can't kick the kid out because it's not his fault so you end up with a school that's not making money uh, it's, and it all just comes down to politics and everyone runs to the government complains and yeah <laughs> i'm just glad i'm done with that stuff <laughs> right yeah yeah absolutely and i think having that philosophy and that ethos that everything happens or has happened for a reason yeah. is a very healthy way to live your life and i think you know that this happens quite a lot that when we're in the heat of the moment and when we're deep in troubles and something very bad is happening to us of course it's difficult to have perspective it's difficult to see how this might turn out to be a good thing. Mm -hmm. But I do think if you take stock and you look at the trajectory and you look at the direction in which your life has taken, then you'll often see, okay, so I had to endure this so that this would happen or in, I guess, enduring this particular pain, it made me stronger in this area. Therefore, I decided to do this. Mm, exactly. I, I can't go into too much detail with this example, but I once made a mistake that cost me because I quickly learned not to work with do the finances late at night. <laughs> right. Um, because I tend to make mistakes. But I made a mistake that cost me, let's say, uh, $1,000. Okay. No, it wasn't, no, it wasn't that much. Okay. Or let's say $1,000. And which made me think of ways to like make sure this never happens again and by spending time figuring out this mistake uh, an idea came along and that idea ended up making me about three thousand dollars yeah 
Wow. And okay. I, I was killing myself over that initial mistake. And now when I look back, and I'm still actually profiting from that idea that came after that. I mean, so it just shows you everything eventually down the line. <laughs> yeah, and I think when you find yourself in a situation where you have to make that money, where, mm -hmm. you know, if you don't, you're absolutely going to suffer, then it can mean that you're a little bit more creative or you might take exactly. a chance on what you're doing because, you know, this is something you have to do. You have to make that money back and... Thank goodness it paid off for you. Yeah, thank goodness. <laughs> but I think that's the problem with most people when you are so busy with your job, you don't have time to just sit back and look at it as a whole and uh, try new creative ideas. We, we don't have a lot of time to just sit and think these days. And I'm trying to really to put in more time, uh, at least like an hour a week, to just look at everything I'm doing if, is there a way to like do it different, do it better, be more creative, um, maybe research something new, just because, I mean, you have to grow. The company needs to grow. I have to keep learning new stuff. Uh, you have to keep up to date with the technology, which is going way too fast for me at the moment. But otherwise, you're just going to fall out of the bus. So. Yeah, yeah. And it's easy to fall into the trap of just doing the same thing every day, just because you're always, I mean, I'm always behind schedule. Like, there's, if I wake up in the morning, I know there's at least 10 hours of work before I can even do anything else where I can just be creative or whatever. It's just the normal stuff every day. So luckily from next year on with more people helping out, um, personally, I'll have less books to publish next year. So I can actually put in more effort into those books. I can give them a bigger marketing budget but i can also look at more creative ways stuff that will take time mm. i mean the, the creative ways that don't cost money normally take a lot more time and then i can just test what works and what doesn't work and see how the readers respond and people like being part of the launch and the project and, and you, you need time for that stuff oh yeah definitely and I mean, you said before about using print on demand to have your books readily available and to get them in bookstores in New York and in London. Is it Lightning Source that you're using at the moment for your print on demand? Um, the Lightning Source, let's call him sister company, the Ingram Spark one, because when I started, I only had, I think, seven or eight books to move from create space back then to mm. them. So they said, now I have to go to Ingram Spark because I think at Lightning Source, you need at least 20, 10 or 20 books already in print, uh, which I was lucky because Ingram Spark, it means the same printers, but you only pay the upload fee. There's not a maintenance fee, like um, every year annual payment for every book, which I hear you do have at Lightning Source. It's more expensive. Right? And you have the same opportunities. The books are available. Uh, bookstores can order them. You've got a return policy. Like we can do author signings. So I'm very happy where I am now. I have moved some books, uh, especially the last four or five books, to Amazon with their new printing system when they now moved CreateSpace into the KDP upload system. And for mainly the reason that they, it's easily available. Um, Amazon used to give me a lot of nonsense, they still do, but where the paperback, they'll say, no, it's out of stock. Uh, how can a print on demand book be out of stock? Right. And then they'll say, uh, or they'll upload the book a week later, the paperback, or then the cover is not showing. There, there's, it's, I know it's a bullying system most of the time, but in the end, it's going to cost the author, he's going to lose out. So, and I have to put them first. So I'm going to use Ingram now for bookstores and libraries and for my personal orders, for signings, everything. And Amazon, they can sell the books that they print. Yeah, that sounds like a very similar model to what Max Booth and Laurie Michelle are doing over at Perpetual Motion Machine Publishing. And, and it is a bit cheaper. 
I mean, mm. the, the, profit, the profit margin is bigger because I'm, you can either sell the book at the same price and make more profit or you can make it like a dollar cheaper and you're still going to have a bit more profit. So I'm going with the one dollar cheaper option and just a little bit more profit for everyone. I mean, a lot of readers will, and one dollar sometimes can be the difference between buy and don't buy. So Right. Yeah, yeah, definitely. What do you think in terms of the quality of the publication when you look at an Ingram Spark book and then when you look at Amazon's new printing system? Because I haven't seen Amazon's new printing system, but I know before when I looked at an Ingram book and I looked at a Create Space and you mm -hmm. look at them side by side, the Ingram one was notably better. I mean... Yes. I, I would say that over the years, Create Space have got a lot better than they were initially. Like initially, mm -hmm. there was such a gulf in difference that I think most people went for Ingram or Lightning Source just because the Create Space looked like it had kind of been botched together in a very amateur fashion. But I That's, know it's definitely better. <laughs> yeah, is is it still the case that Ingram books are looking? better than the Amazon ones or is is there like I guess less of a noticeable difference? It's definitely less notable but I'd still say it's about 10% a better product the Ingram Spark versions. Yeah yeah. In a business I'll have to look at the profit lines and the, I, I, I didn't want to do this initially and I earlier this year I just said let's just give it a test see how it goes and I haven't had any complaints and we've sold more paperbacks. Amazon's giving us less nonsense and right. making sure books are on sale on time with the ebook releases. So, so far I'm happy and the, the, I mean, we've had quality issues with Ingram as well, where pages were cut wrong, loose pages, but luckily if you send them some photos, they'll return it. But you'd, you'd still think they'd at least have an actual person looking at the book and saying, yo, this is not, we have to reprint this one, but apparently not. <laughs> yeah. Well, I suppose they're yeah, thinking, well. yeah, they're, they're thinking how can they maximize their money? And mm. I guess their logic is that maybe let's say 95% of the time it's fine. So rather than having their staff check, all of those books for five percent error they'll just let them out without even looking and then deal with the extra admin when people contact them with issues but yeah mm. i think you know in terms of putting the customer first you would like them to at least have a glance at your book it's like can you just exactly. check it before you send out all of these units i mean i've had another issue with them as well where uh, the return policy, the address was to an author, or let's say my staff member in America. So any returns from bookstores would go there. And at least then we'd have books that we can sell at conventions and everything. And unfortunately, they sent the returns for the first six months. I think I was there. They sent it to my address here in South Africa. And then they charged me the shipping, oh, no. which means I've got like two boxes of books here that I don't have a market for here in South Africa and it cost me a lot of money and eventually they, because I took them on about this, it was my mistake, I put in the correct return address, they looked at the address for the, the bill, like the payment address where I live and then they, I think they gave back half of the money on the second box they sent but that's about it but at least I got something back so there were some and I think that was just when I started out um, at full time yeah when I left the school we basically the first month doing it full time I had this massive financial setback which I had to push through luckily I mean, I'm still here so <laughs> mm. yeah I know when I was starting up this is horror and using lightning source i was speaking to david moody who's got infected books and also done various 
self-publishing ventures and he said with returns he normally just fills it in so that if they're gonna return it it's like just destroy it just get rid of it and take take the hit of that money because if you get them to return it physically to you you can end up paying a lot of money in terms of the postage exactly. and potentially being in a situation where you know you're not gonna make a profit off those books anyway but yeah it's a, it's a difficult one and of course as you'll know the other frustrating thing is if you want your books to appear in big bookstores you then have to give a substantial discount to retailers mm. and i mean i don't know if this has happened to you before but sometimes when you're giving a discount if you're not careful you can look at it and see like well i'm hardly making any profit on this unit at all and i found with one book in australia it was like if i keep it at that price i'm going to actually make a small loss <laughs> because of how much discount i have to give you so you know either you put a smaller percentage down as a retailer discount which then means that it's going to be difficult for bookstores to justify or you have to hike up the price which then means it's going to be harder for a reader to be able to justify forking out for the books it's a very difficult situation indeed i have to check at least once a year i go through all the books and look at the all the different markets just to make sure that there is a profit on every sale yeah and i found now twice especially with australia where there was a minus it was yeah. in the negative yeah. and they won't email you they won't tell you listen there's a mistake here or maybe auto corrected nothing you have to manually check it and this becomes a bigger and bigger job every time because every year there's publishing more books because it's spent on demand it's not like the books are going out of stock out of sale off the market uh, unless the author and i agree that book stays on so it's just becoming more and more of a, a job to do and you'd actually like the support of them checking it at least helping out right right and i would imagine as well like surely it can't be that difficult for them to program to a system yeah in <laughs> which like hang on your book has gone into minus figures we're just sending <laughs> you an alert to let you know about that because nobody at least that i could imagine would want to put a book out where it's costing them money every time someone buys it i mean that's completely counterproductive so i think for people listening if you're an independent publisher seeing as both me and joe have had this problem check your books are uh, making money particularly in that australian market Another thing I check with Australia as well, and I don't know why it's them every time. Um, if when you put down the price for your book, now let's say it's 25 Australian dollars, and let's say you're making $2 profit on it, they can sell that book for $40 and you will still only make your $2 profit. And I emailed them about this and they just said, um, you give them the preferred sale price they can ask whatever they want but you don't make more money they make more money so now what happens the australian authors i work with and the readers ask why are the books so expensive it's like well it's out of my hands yeah there's nothing i can do i've complained i've sent in complaints i've had authors phone them they they sell it at whatever price they want and which is weird because with amazon.com and UK, um, sometimes they have these massive sales where the book is selling for $5 less, but you still make the same profit. So why can they sell it for less? And I keep the same, which is good. But when they sell it for more, they keep the extra money. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, absolutely corrupt. There's no, there's and no the sense. And the not going to sell at that price anyway. So why make it that expensive? Yeah, yeah, definitely. I just wanted to ask because you said now you've got some titles that you're selling via Amazon print and then you're also getting them via lightning source for your own personal 
copies and for sending things out and for getting them signed, etc. Do you mm. then have two separate ISBNs or do you use the one ISBN because it is just the paperback version? No, um, if you upload to Ingram or Lightning Source first, mm. the moment the book is approved, then I upload it to Amazon. You can use the same ISBN. If you do it the other way around, Ingram will, will not accept that ISBN number. Okay. But Amazon will. Um, unless the book has different dimensions or perhaps a different page count, then you need a different ISBN because it's actually now two different yeah. versions of the same book. Yeah, now that makes sense. And obviously that's important for people to hear as well. It's important for me to know because now I'm thinking about <laughs> Amazon print and if I want to do that, but yeah, it would be frustrating if someone was listening and they thought, okay, I'm going to action that. They upload it to Amazon and it's like, well, sorry, now that you've taken that step to begin with, you're going to have to do it again. You're going to have to you use two ISBNs in this instance. You, you can actually get a free ISBN number from Amazon, but uh, I don't really trust it because there's, I mean... <sighs> Some people debate that if they own the ISBN number, they might actually own the, the book, the copyright on the book or something. I haven't looked into that part yet, but for now I'm sticking to my own ISBN numbers and barcodes. Um, and the nice, or well, the one thing about in South Africa, you can get free ISBN numbers, but then you need to send samples of the books to all our national libraries. And I think there's like five of them or something. And for me, that's not going to work because I have to order the books from abroad. I have to ship them in to me first and then fill in these forms and then send them to the national libraries. So it's cheaper for me to actually just buy ISBN numbers off the Internet from America, wherever, instead of getting them for free. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. There's, there's a lot of research to, that goes into, I mean, you know this, into running a press or even a, a self-publisher. There's a lot of stuff you need to learn to make sure you're saving money because it's all, it all comes down to your profit margin I mean, because there's a lot of work. Oh, yeah. <laughs> just to play even, it's not going to work. Or to even lose money. Yeah. It's not yeah, and I think something that both of us are kind of passionate about and both of us are concerned about is this idea of experimentation, of pushing mm. further, of seeing if different things will work and if that can be a way to gain profit or to gain readership. And it's always about evolving and never staying still. And I mean, that's why... We've done various things. That's why we've both jumped into Patreon to play around with that, to mm. see how that works. That's why you've done things like the Indiegogo with Crystal Lake 2.0, which we'll talk about in a minute. And I actually quite enjoyed the, this whole, the, let's call it crowdfunding thing, because it wasn't just for one book. And the two I've done so far, that and both successful, were for the company itself to so people can see we are growing we're using that money to put out more books and help more authors and new imprints new divisions new everything it's it's not just to put out one book so we can make the profit of the yeah. book yeah i think that's what people quite enjoyed about these fundraisers yeah and the patreon i also enjoy i hope i'll have more time for it next year to put in a bit more effort there because it's it is worth it and the people who are there enjoy it yeah i mean and as you can see not only from your own experience but from what i've been doing as well i mean patreon it, it will grow and it will see that you'll gain from it but you really do have to slog away at it i mean some people contact me and ask me about Patreon because they're seeing that I'm having success with this is horror with it and I will be asked sometimes like you know is, is it easy it's like no it's not easy it's like most things that are worthwhile doing are not easy but if you're prepared to put in the work 
then you know certainly do it but don't have any illusion that this is going to be passive income don't think that <laughs> you putting this page up is going to be enough you've got to always experiment always look at growing and you know in doing that sometimes you will fail sometimes you will try something and it won't work but yeah. i mean goodness we've gone to the samuel beckett quote before where it's like you know fail fail better that's <laughs> basically exactly. what creativity is all about i enjoy it it's 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 quite a challenge and but i like that close connection to the the readers and the fans, um, and some of the money can go towards helping people. I mean, exactly. So yeah, they get books. The authors get support. Um, I'll 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 grow. I'll put more time into it next year as well and see where it can go. But what I actually would like, and I've emailed Patreon about this, is awarding someone like as a prize for some giveaway or whatever a free month subscription but they they've never replied because it would be very nice i mean imagine giving a hundred people of the first month for, for free and some of them will leave and some of them will stick around yeah that's a really good idea as well and i mean something that i've said before is you know for people who are on the edge about supporting us on patreon i'm trying to you know, appeal to people and say, try it for a month, pledge at the minimum mm. level, $1, see if it's a good fit for you. And if it's not, then please leave. You know, we want people mm. who feel that they're spending their money wisely. But if Patreon were to incorporate what you're suggesting, I mean, so many more people would take me up on exactly. the offer if I'm saying like, look, try it. I'm so confident that you're going to enjoy it. I'm giving you the first month for free. And if you don't enjoy it, then I wouldn't want you to spend your money on it anyway. So everyone wins. Including Patreon, because yeah. if they have more people on there, the little bit that they keep will obviously increase. Exactly. Yeah. And I mean, it might be that somebody takes a chance on crystal lake or on this is horror via patreon and for whatever reason they don't kind of continue that but because they're now aware of patreon maybe they look at okay what other creators are on here or maybe they become a creator themselves so you're exactly. right it does benefit everyone <laughs> and perhaps more than anybody it benefits Patreon, so we need to maybe, get on to them about this. <laughs> <laughs> maybe if enough people email them, they might respond. They might wake up. But we'll see. <laughs> yeah, so there you go. If you're listening and you like this idea, you've got to email Patreon and tell them to consider implementing an option for creators to award a free month. The other option, of course, is basically paying someone back, but that's just a risky way. Personal payments and PayPal. Yeah, I mean, the thing with what you're saying is that it would all be automated. And I think as well, even if you say, I'll pay you back, well, there's an element of trust and it's a little bit cumbersome exactly. anyway. And probably mm. most people would be like, oh, you know, if I'm that interested, I'll just pay the dollar. They wouldn't pay the dollar to then have the dollar given back to them at a later date. Mm. And by the time transaction fees have come into it, it's probably cost both you and the person who you're paying back a little bit more than that dollar anyway. Mm. Thank you so much for listening to The Conversation with Joe Meinhardt. We'll be back next time with part two, the final part of this conversation. But of course, if you want to get that ahead of the crowd, if you want to listen to that right now, all you need to do is head on over to www.patreon.com forward slash this is horror. Not only are you going to get access to 
the final part with Joe, but you're going to get early bird access to every single conversation that we have. And we've got a hell of a lot of good guests coming up. At $4 right now, you can listen to us chatting with Charlene Harris. It's the full conversation with the author perhaps most famous for the Suki Stackhouse series, which was later adapted into the television show True Blood. At $3, we recently unboxed Stephen Graham Jones's The Night Cyclist. So that is our sister podcast where Bob Pastorello and I unbox and analyze stories and films on Story Unboxed, the horror podcast on the craft of writing. So if you like the sound of that and you'd also like to support the longest running horror fiction interview podcast, then do consider becoming our patron over at www.patreon.com forward slash this is horror. Okay, before I wrap up, let us have a quick word from our sponsors. A satanic cult, a woman's brutal assault. Can Kirsty Thompson face her darkest fear before a demon from hell is unleashed? The Mark by best-selling horror author Lee Mountford is a haunting ghost story that will have you sleeping with the lights on. Available in Kindle, paperback and hardback editions, as well as a high-quality audiobook produced by Hannibal Hills. Search for The Mark on Amazon and Audible now. Don't just read horror, experience it. Introducing If It Bleeds by Matthew M. Bartlett, a new charitable chapbook from Nightscape Press. One third of all proceeds go to the Dakin Humane Society. A toe-tapping track from way back spreads like a virus through Leeds, Massachusetts, heralding a new era of unspeakable evil. WXXT, the slithering tongue in the ear of the Pioneer Valley. Are you ready to rock? As always, I would like to leave you with a quote, something to ponder. And this is from Alice Walker. If art doesn't make us better, then what on earth is it for? I'll see you in the next episode, but until then, take care of yourself, be good to one another, read horror, keep on writing, and have a great, great day. 